TikTok.com slash... Is that how you do it? I don't think so. Brunch! Hit it, boys! Peter's got gunk on his arms. I do. It's a little dirt. Is it healed? It is. Uh, yeah, it's it's peeling right now. Uh, I got a tattoo sleeve last week, and uh, it's a work in progress, but it's uh, it's healing. Did you choose to get it on your left arm so it would heal faster? Why? Uh, why is that? Because that's what healing is. It's when it stays on the left. The tattoo is on your left. That's not true. Heal? Yeah. When you say heal to a dog? Yeah. I believe it means get on my left. No, when you say heal to a dog, that means like slow down, like like pull up. I thought heal means like come walk beside me. Usually, yeah, that's on your right though, if it's if you're walking a dog. In the United States? You would be on, yeah, you would be on the left side. I think you would be on the Right, well, it depends on what side of the street you are. Yeah, right. But I it think it's like on if you're the, in the United States or the UK, you want the dog on the sidewalk because that's where the people are. Makes things interesting. <laughs> you're, I think that the owner would rather put themselves in danger of the road. And you're Co- definitely correct. not telling when you're not you're not but, telling a dog to get closer to the road. It's like going on a date. You have to be on the closest to the street side, and you have to have the lady closest. Uh, uh, furthest away from the street, right? Yeah, you're right. protecting. So in that case, well, I guess it. De- on, in that case, you'd be on the left side. The human would be on the left side. The dog would be on the right side. Is that a dated line of thinking to think that if you're on a date, you have to bring a dog with you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm an old fashioned kind of fella. I I believe that chivalry isn't dead. So anytime I show up, you better believe Summer's right there with me. That would be, that'd be fucking annoying. Honestly, I, I I said to my therapist today, I was like, I'm, I really, I have like a. Everyone thinks they're an asshole or whatever, but I'm like, I I feel like I'm being such like a like really just being an asshole and like becoming an old man and grumpy and everything like that. Uh, so I hate that. My next take after saying that is, if a friend told me that someone showed up to a first date with a dog, I'd be like, I'm out on that person. <laughs> I don't know. It, 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 it They're doing work. too much. It can work. But like, it's a, I don't know. It's, it's, you don't want to, you don't want to bring an additional element of stress to a first date. Well, what's frustrating, what's always been frustrating for me when I've gone on dates is I can't help but bring a dog on the date. Because you're a dog. Because I got that dog in me. That's right. <laughs> so short of surgery, woof, woof, woof. short of, yeah, true. Like I'll show up if it's like a blind date and they be like, uh, DJ? I'd be like, that's right, where my dog's at? And like all the fellas start barking so they know that like we out here. Mm-hmm. It's, it's essentially marking your territory. <laughs> Imagine, I don't think that people date like that. I mean, I've, whether on a date or not, I've been in restaurants and stuff, and I've never heard that go down. And if it did, it would be pretty loud because all the fellows would have to bark. You would absolutely join in, right? I mean, if, if I were in the middle of yeah. a restaurant and a fella yelled like, "Where are my dogs at?" Yeah. As long as Ooh. I realized, as long <laughs> as I realized that it was a call to everybody. Mm-hmm. Like, if he were at one big table by, like, with a, a big group of people, yeah, he could just be speaking to. The, his, the dogs, his like direct his direct dogs. dogs. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But if he's at a table for two and Putting yells out, a call out for the diamond dogs and yells out where my dog's at, I know that my dog needs backup. Mm-hmm. I did see there's a clip. Uh, no dog left behind. That's right. Uh, that's on dogs. I saw a clip of uh, an Arsenal player. It's like a the, the algorithm you you've heard. You know that we're, Pete and I are both just in the throes of the algorithm but the algorithm actually gave me like a kind of clean clip which was an arsenal player in some interview being asked uh are you the funniest player on the team and he was like no he's like who's the funniest player matt turner unintentionally (laughs) and they were like why and he was like just americans man (laughs) and he was like what and he was like he just got these americanisms and he said that uh one of his uh teammates was complaining to the ref or something and turner ran up to him and was like hey 
calm down, dog. This is a dog fight, <laughs> which sounds if like Americans were telling that story, I'd be like, that's a good teammate right there. Yeah. But hearing a a British person or any like anybody who's not American do an impression of an American person, you're like, ah oh, man, we probably shouldn't call everybody dog, huh? I don't know. I mean, like they they call people things that. That Famously, is true. we cannot. That is true. And uh, I dare say getting into soccer has been a confusing thing for my, my tongue. It's changed your vocabulary a little bit. And yeah, I mean, a lot of, a lot of bollocks out there. A lot of, a lot of bloody, a lot of, a lot of set Ted, pieces. Is Ted Lasso thrown around the C word? Ted Lasso says the yeah, C word okay. a lot. Okay, yeah. Yeah. I, I think that Roy Kent says it quite a bit. No, like Ted Lasso says it. Does he really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He calls uh, Jamie Tart it in season five. Season five? Yeah. I think season he's... six, he throws it at Rebecca and everybody is, whoa. No, Rebecca, the only thing Rebecca's throwing at the world it's is fucking, charm. It, and hourglasses. Mm. Oh, boy. That figure. She's got a good figure. Outrageous. Watch it. Watch your mouth. What do you uh, mean? She's my lady. She is. Okay. My lady. <laughs> if, you, fedora. if you met uh, like uh, Hannah Waddingham, that's what you would say. My lady? Yeah. You, my lady? She'd, she'd think you were a dog. She'd say, hey, why don't you walk on my left, you fucking weirdo? And you'd be like, ah, ah, bah, 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 we're in the UK. And then... Uh, there's it, I, Step on my throat, bruv. Every second of this podcast has been a challenge for me because all I can think about are these borderline scripted clips. We've done two in a row and both have blown up. Mm -hmm. Do you know it's so what much that pressure does now? to... Well, you're just like what that does to us because that's not what we do. We don't do uh, being received well. And especially both these clips have been Taylor Swift clips. Both of them have been clearly eaten up by people a lot younger than us so we have a new market and and people that like we famously made fun of a lot and like mocked a lot the com have you seen the comments on the clips it's a lot of like this is me well yeah well, but one of them said at first i thought he was making fun of swifties then i realized he's the biggest swifty of them all mm. Don't do any more research. So and then I there. replied to that comment and went, me, <laughs> just to make sure they knew that I was there and then they could follow me if they wanted to. I did that too. I mean, I, I've seen... We, yeah, I've, we've both been replying to those a lot. Like, hey, like, look, we we don't have the best numbers here on uh, yeah. TikTok or Instagram. So if you want to toss follows there. I was pretty proud of my comment on the uh, on the Taylor, the what ideal did, set list one. What did you comment? I commented um, uh, center earth greater than center stage. That was good. Yeah, thank that you. That was a good clip. Yeah, two for two. Uh, both about Taylor Swift. We are going to do two more today. And uh, they're going to be on topical things because we did notice people were eating up that Succession t-shirt. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That was like probably, I don't know if I want to say more commented on than the Taylor Swift stuff, but like almost equally. A lot of like, where where do I get that shirt, bestie? So we should, what we need to do is we need to blow the brunch budget, which, by the way, patreon.com slash listen to brunch. We are just like lighting the brunch account on fire right now uh but we should are be getting we? yeah we should be getting t-shirts that can get comments yeah so like right now i'm wearing a fucking white t-shirt doing horrible got my right right fast kids don't know what that is no nope. i uh if that I, said eras tour then i'd be like oh oh my god your eras tour outfit looks fucking amazing i've hit like my uh my t-shirt and clothing capacity like i've canceled my subscription service to the the stitch fix which was good while it lasted but i canceled it and i've hit my capacity to the point where like now if i get a new shirt it's mm -hmm. one in one out we have both talked about doing that forever I'm, I'm i've there. definitely never done I'm, it i'm there I, i've done like a lot of drop-offs from the at the donation bin recently really yeah like i'm i'm actively if I put in, if I put a T-shirt in my wardrobe, I'm literally taking one out immediately. You have no idea how badly I want to. I want to do like the uh, Vincent Carthizer guy, the guy from Mad Men, Pete Campbell, mm -hmm. who has just like no possessions. I want to get rid of so much stuff, but every fucking thing I have, I do kind of need 
a little bit, and it's so frustrating. But I, I, I could do that with clothes, although I don't don't lead the rock and roll lifestyle I do, kids. I am at any point in time between it used to be a medium or a large. Now I'm going between a medium and an extra large. You know how much fucking clothes I got to keep around for that? There's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of room to play there. It sucks. I got. I have to have jeans in multiple sizes. It's I would love Don't to. wear jeans. That's the simple thing. No, I'm 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 becoming like a jeans year round guy. You're not gonna catch me in shorts this summer unless I'm doing a Bob B. Weir inspired look. In okay. which case you're gonna catch me in very short shorts. But fair. So uh, far I've I haven't done shorts once, except when I've been blading. I, I don't I I've done shorts a few times, but I'm I'm just like I'm I'm kinda out on jeans. I'm just like joggers or like casual not jeans, but like I don't know what you would call them. Casual, like form-fitting pants, stretch pants. I've been doing lighter colors of late. Famously, I am currently wearing lighter colors. You, everyone's been noticing that this episode. It just makes it just makes me feel a little bit better. I don't know if it makes me look any better. I think it's a but good look. just like I like to give off a little bit uh, lighter. Famously, when we were in Portland, I kept singing that song. Uh, I look real good today <laughs> yeah, yeah. because you and I both agreed that I looked real good. Yeah. And then I fell asleep for seven. hours. What was that hours. from again? I think a com- we we did not decide what it was from. We just decided that uh, we'd be I singing that. Real good I look today. real good today. And then like, I'd take a picture of you and you'd look at it. And you'd be like, I look real good today. <laughs> that is awesome. That's a nice little mantra to have, folks, if you uh, want to wanna do that. So... Gaslight yourself into, even if it's not true, gaslight yourself into thinking that you look good. Yeah, TikTok.com slash, is that how you do it? I don't think so. I, it might be TikTok.com slash at listen to brunch. That is They true. do that weird, like, you have to have the full handle with the at symbol and the even with the slash. Right. And Pete, is, are you just Pete Blackburn or are you Pete Blackburn 25? I am Pete Blackburn 25. Gross. I'm Brave Dave Bean, which I hate that I've settled into having Thank three you. different handles that's no good i feel like you got to change the instagram it's one. very incongruous um good word by me i but i can you change the instagram handle if you're verified maybe but like instagram's verification is so lenient that like you even if it takes it away you'll get it back in like four seconds you think so yeah i don't know i don't know if i can Risk that. I mean, I don't behave verified on Instagram. No. Instagram, you just got to fucking try everything. You don't really behave everything. verified anywhere. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I can, depending on the day, I can be pretty annoying on Twitter. That's ver- that's verified behavior. <laughs> Fair. Any behavior on Twitter is verified Did you behavior. know that I am uh, the thickest 18-year-old on OnlyFans? Uh, did someone make a fake... Uh, 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 or is there a Pete Blackburn on OnlyFans? <laughs> no, that's like one of like the now there's that's a, an addition to the lexicon of annoying automated tr- Twitter replies is like I've I've gotten like a bunch of I'm the thickest 18 year old on OnlyFans oh. and it's like a bot or whatever that just like spams replies. It's now it's it's a ton of betting. just just nudes. Yep. Yeah. And then the betting uh, where it's like. Check out my pics, blah. Yeah, and it's like it's like a weird picture of like a computer screen. Yeah, uh, and then there's I'm the thickest eighteen year old on OnlyFans. Yeah, I cool uh, website you got there, Elon. I don't really look at reply That's or no, a I, I have lie. Them, no, no, no. I, I know the, the way of putting it is I have uh, them filtered out, okay. so I don't see as many replies as the way of putting it. The ones I see, I, I mean. During the basketball playoffs, there was, I don't know, sports Twitter is a mess. But I, I knew that when the Celtics lost, people would be like, that's it. Got to get rid of J-. People were saying, let Jalen Brown walk. I'm like, first of all, he's not a free agent right now. And you don't let a player that good walk, you idiot. But uh, very frustrating. The Celtics are out of it. Very frustrating that uh, there's really no teams I particularly like playing sports right now. I'm happy for the Panthers. Happy for the Knights. I'll be cool with either of those uh, outcomes. And I'll also be cool with either outcome in the NBA, which is the worst. I hate being indifferent in the finals of these mm-hmm. sports. 
And I'm not watching baseball right now. I don't really care. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of like that way with the, I'm not going to I don't I don't really care about the NBA. So, uh like I I would if the Celtics were in it, but I don't really like Nuggets or Heat who gives a shit. Uh the NHL I don't really care. And like I don't even care that like I'm I'm not going to the final this year. I'm just like, yeah, whatever. Like it would have been cool to go to Vegas and Fort Lauderdale, but like uh. I just don't really care about what happens there. Like no matter what happens, I'm going to be like Okay, pretty cool. Mm. And that's it. That's the extent of my feelings. Is uh is this a banner week for television in that in how what in 3 calendar days you had Succession and Barry finales and I think you should leave season 3. That's pretty massive, bruv. Isn't it? It is, but it's like heel it is, but it's it's kind of like that three headed dragon meme, but like two which of, is which, but two of the dragons are like the doofy face. Yeah, what is Barry? And yeah, the, yeah. It, like nothing compares to what nothing compares to the hype of Succession. Although I gotta say, I was on my way over here and I was listening to the radio, and friend of the podcast uh, Megan Ottolini asked where Succession ranked in somebody's top three, and I was taken aback because I was like is succession supposed to be a top three thing? And then she gave her top three and it was the wire mad men and succession. And I was like, that's a totally acceptable top three. I, I know that succession is deeply, deeply beloved, mm -hmm. but I never actually considered it like no, one of the best shows ever. No, me neither. And we had the conversation when it started, when this season started and I was like, I don't like this show as much as everybody right. else likes it. And like, I, I love it, but I don't love it to like the degree that everybody was so passionate about it. I, re I always respected you for that. That's a very brunch take of being like, <laughs> hey, I like this a lot. It's I don't think it's the best. Yeah, but I'll tell you what, the the way that it elevated itself in this final season is really impressive from a show that like I already loved to now I would consider it like the elite of the elite. I, I think that they they did such a good job with this final season that it's it's hard not to consider it like one of the better shows ever. You know what its problem is though? It's so multifaceted and I guess it's just like double faceted in that there's the minutia of it all and there's the dialogue. People, I love both things. I probably like the dialogue better than I like the stories or whatever but there are for sure people that do just like it because roman's funny or yeah. because uh tom and greg or whatever like those the elements of the show are so amazing that if there are episodes like this past one uh like my dad loves succession and he didn't love the finale because it was this was like his last chance at Roman getting off some fucking hilarious lines, but they had shit to do. Right, they had, like yeah. they, they had to actually end the show. A, I've seen a lot of people be like, "I did not like that as much as the rest of you guys," and I bet it's because the finale or the yeah, show, the finale. Oh, and wow. I bet it's because their favorite thing about the show was how fucking funny it was. Yeah, I, I mean that's that's fair, but like again, you have to you have to get somewhere. <laughs> like you know what I'm saying? Mm. There's a purpose to this. There's not a purpose to a lot of the episodes, and uh, that was famously it was bullshit. But that's the purpose. Yeah, uh, that Justin was Bieber. Uh, Look, you got tattoos on your arm. You're already talking like Justin Bieber. That's right. Famously, he had an album called Purpose. It was his Reputation era before the Reputation era. Um, yeah, I, I mean, like there's there's definitely something to love for. Like if you're anybody, but when it comes to succession, but like, what's the weakest part of succession? It's probably the plot. Like the I mean, plot doesn't. Logan. Well, because he's dead. Yeah. Yeah. Fair. Second uh, Hugo. He, yeah. yeah <laughs> almost dead. <laughs> Very <laughs> well. Sandy. Uh. Yeah. So yeah. It's Carl and Frank. The weakest parts of succession: Logan, Sandy, Hugo. Oh, famously the probably, kid. Pro no, probably Logan's brother. No, the kid. Which kid? The waiter. Oh, yep, yep. Mm -hmm. Oh, that was a false memory. That's that's true. Spoilers. Yeah. Uh, that blew my mind, dude, that that didn't happen. Yeah. I was like, oh, it didn't happen? What? Well, it's, it's, a, it's Crazy. a fictional TV show. <laughs> right. So I was kidding when I said it didn't happen, but like, is our Jesse Armstrong in Mark Mylod uh, unreliable narrators? 
They Who do you trust? Created this fake world. Who do you trust? Man, we did we did a little Patreon uh, epi about this. Patreon.com slash listen to brunch. And fucking uh fucking Jeremy Strong, man. He is as goaded as goaded can possibly get. He was I've watched that episode twice now. So fucking good. Yeah. I mean, do we wanna play the uh we did a reaction chip for the Patreon just talking about our thoughts on the finale mm. and like I I mean I loved it and I don't yeah. do you want to play the discussion? We can put it in we could put it here, we could put it at the end. Yeah, I, put it, I mean I just put it here. We'll talk about it and uh I think it just fits. Yeah, all right. Here you go. Yeah, uh, there's spoilers obviously, so like if you if you haven't watched Succession and you want to and or if you haven't watched the the finale there's obvious. It's very spoiler heavy. So uh, timestamps will let you know when uh, when this discussion is over. But this is our reaction to the succession finale and also the Barry finale. All right. It is Tom. There's reason to feel the yeah, app makes sense. It was always going to uh, my initial thought on this finale. I loved it mainly because it made sense dramaturgically. I didn't care who it was going to be. My money was on Greg famously, but as long as the person who it ended up being, whether it was Matson's call or whether it was the Roy children's call, I just wanted to make sense and feel like a succession episode. And for Matson to end up making the call and to pick Tom, I thought made all the sense in the world because he's not picking somebody for a particularly great job. Like he's, he, he's choosing somebody who's going to end up being reviled. So yeah, he's choosing somebody who's not going to get in someone. his way. Right. It makes sense that he would pick somebody that he doesn't really like that much and that he doesn't care if they end up killing him. He probably wants a, look, I'm going to take credit for whatever goes right. Anyway, I need somebody. He said, use the term pain sponge. I need somebody for when shit's going wrong and when we're slashing people, they can point to and say, we hate that guy. And you, motherfucker, are going to say yes to absolutely anything. Shiv tipped him off there and may have sealed her own fate when she said he will suck the biggest dick in the room. That's mm -hmm. probably what made him think, you know what? I don't want to just keep this guy around. This is my CEO. But uh, I've blabbed enough. Uh, what are your thoughts on this finale? I thought it was like I thought it was perfect. Uh, I thought it was about as good. And you you said it like well, like you wanted it to feel like a succession episode. The reason that I loved it so much more than anything was that it kept with every theme that succession has had all along. And uh, at the end of the day, I didn't want the ending to be some like fairy tale shit that went against what we had just watched for three and a half seasons. So like as as much as I would have been like, yeah good for Kendall, like good for Kendall for finally turning it around. Had that, when that episode ended, I don't know how many other people would have felt this way, but I would have felt this way where I'd have been like, well, Kendall's just going to fuck that up. Like two episodes down the road, like two non-existent episodes down the road. It could have been a nicely tied bow to say, okay, Kendall finally got the seat that he's been angling for this entire time. But nothing that we've seen over four years has suggested that he's going to sustain in that seat and not fuck everything up. Even during this final season, and I know we had this conversation like earlier this week or last week, like when I talked about like, remember how I was like, Kendall has had so many I'm him moments, but then followed by I'm not him. And it just keeps going back and forth with the seesaw with Kendall where he has these moments of being him and then immediately will like kind of throw that away or like kind of show that he's actually not him so i'm glad that they kind of played both sides in the in the finale i needed there i didn't know this until i saw it but it would not have done the show proper service if there wasn't a massive kendall meltdown mm -hmm. to end the series and not a baseline kendall meltdown because we get one of those every couple of episodes sometimes in i mean end of season two that finale he turns on on uh, Logan, but that's not really a meltdown. We've seen when he crashes and when mm -hmm. he has his dark his, moments. Like, real desperation meltdown. There needed to be, though, a meltdown that was on par. His version, I should say. There needed to be a meltdown that was his version of the Roman meltdown that we got in the previous mm -hmm. episode. Because and I think we, that, that we got it like that. Em yes. That emphatic, that emphatic meltdown put with the exclamation point on the, I am the eldest boy like that. 
that is the I think like the final the final nail in uh, Kendall's coffin where it's dude you're just a fucking child you're a it, child who wants the thing that like he's always coveted since he was a little boy and that's just the little boy coming out I'm the eldest boy I'm the oldest one I deserve it yeah man that scene the I am the eldest boy tantrum that was uh shoot why can't i think of her name uh gone girl who's the uh why can't i think of her name uh shit uh, rosamund like, pike yeah okay that was rosamund pike versus dinklage in i care a lot level of showdown of just awesome acting two bad motherfuckers he, uh, jeremy strong and sarah snook deserve every award possible for that her reaction her her mocking reaction to I am the eldest boy was amazing. I mean, and obviously, that, that entire boardroom scene between the three of them, I think was yeah. incredible. So the, the, the two like big moments with all three kids in the f final half of that episode were both so good. The one at the, the mother's house was really good in giving them like their, their like humanity and like kind of reminding us that these are childhood siblings and they have these memories and like they, they do love each other and they can still be like human siblings, even though we see so much over the course of the years where they're just like bickering business people. They still have like that humanity to them. I thought that was really important to kind of remind us. And then immediately following like the next day, just hours later, they have that scene where they just revert back to these petulant child children who are angling for something and i think that the boardroom scene was so good at just like showing us the 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 motivations and sort of like the inner workings of each kid where kendall is just so focused on the thing that he almost has and he will do anything 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 to get it and honestly i think that it was a good sh scene for shiv just being like i saw some people saying that like shiv was exposed as like a dumbass for not voting Yes, okay, we'll like, get to that. We'll get to that. You, you, okay, I won't get there. That I won't go there then. But uh, no, go, like, go where you're going to go. But I'll say, like, if we if we want to break down her decision, we can for sure do that. Well, it's it's. I think I I don't look at Shiv and Roman in that scene and say like, oh, they fucked it up. They were the ones that had the awareness to realize we're we're out of our depths here. Like this, we just yes. like we can't do this. <laughs> like and they they if Kendall were as passionate that they go through with the Gojo deal. They would have done that too. You know what I'm saying? Like this was Roman wasn't so passionate that Matson doesn't get this. He was he he could be talked into it. And he sided with his brother and he didn't like Matson because Matson's a prick and he annoyed him and whatever. That's fine. Kendall this always just wants to the, win. I right. This, this was not the I will to quote Kendall. If this doesn't go through, if I don't get this, I will die. Roman was going to be fine. Indifference, probably the better word. Roman was going to be indifferent either way. For Shiv, I think that ultimately, like I've stewed on this. I think that she was just trying to punt. And you have to keep in mind, by the way, the boardroom meeting, I didn't get this until the rewatch. The boardroom meeting is right after the estate. That's what I'm saying. Like th th this is... An hours hour, later two hours after they're finding out that it's tom so like emotions are still really really high for them i think that with shiv she's just punting on how big this has to be how big a part of her life this has to be because she's not choosing between being a a spare part under kendall and a ceo under Matson. She's choosing between being a spare part under both of them. Mm -hmm. And in choosing to put the Gojo deal through, she gets a ton of money. She doesn't have to be particularly front-facing if she doesn't want to. It's like in Seinfeld when he's having the Sunday on the plane and the fudge is on the bottom. Mm -hmm. you can, she gets to control how big a part of her life this ends up being. And she, so It does make sense for her, dramaturgically. It definitely, it definitely makes sense for her. It makes sense for her more than anybody because she gets the money from the sale but she also kind of gets to keep a status because she's married to the CEO 
of the of the when the deal goes through. So like it, it probably works out better for her than anybody, aside from maybe Roman, who just wants to be disassociated from all of it. And like that, I thought that was cool. Where like Roman was just never. I, I feel like Roman. They kind of said that during the the um the stay at the mom's house. Roman never really wanted to be a part of it. He just wanted to like feel approval. He wanted to be approved by like whether it was uh, Logan whether it was like the siblings, he just wanted approval. Um, but Kendall always just wanted to win. And I think like if that was Shiv's mindset, Shiv would would have voted it through, like voted yes and or voted no. And then she would have fucked over Madsen. Like she could have done the petty play and won by blocking Madsen, who I think she just realized that like she she had lost. Like she she played the game and she lost. And th- because of that, she kind of had to do what she thought was the smartest thing. And her by her saying, like, I don't think you will be good at this, is saying, like, she was voting for the smart outcome yeah, rather no, she, than voting to win. In the end, she ended up being more like Logan than any of the other kids. I, yeah, so that was one of the things I was going to ask you. Like, like who... If there was a him, like he's who was him, him? it who was, was him. It was Shiv. It was Shiv. It was, Absolutely. Yeah. Although, and, I, I, and that's not to say that like she was Logan or that she could have done the job. I always like I think that she would have always been taken advantage of. I don't think that she was super smart with a lot of her dealings, but she had more awareness than the other two. Kendall, I, I still though think that Kendall is him, and Kendall would Kendall would have done a better job as CEO than Tom would. But it's tough to compare because the job when once it's part of gojo is so different than the job if they had tried to continue doing what they were doing i think that honestly kendall would have done a fine job and no. i think his that- ego would have gotten the way man at every step of the way and he's he he needed to be part of like once they decided that like it needed to be one person it was all over because like kendall needs to be checked mm. cuz his ego is just outrageous and he's he's so dumb like he 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 he's him when it comes to like being in front of a microphone or being on stage like he can he can project as him but he's not actually him but man if tom ever has like do you think that matson watched the uh that deposition <laughs> probably like, not. like do, do you think he could not have he definitely has no respect for tom but do you think he knows just how dumb a motherfucker he put in a front facing position. No, and I don't think he really cares. Like, <laughs> you know, it's it's one of those situations where like if Tom isn't liked or whatever, like it doesn't doesn't matter to Madsen. Like I, Tom Tom easily could be a one or two year CEO after all the fucking mm-hmm. cuts are made, he can easily be replaced by somebody else. I do like the uh, that, uh, and this is going to be a tie to another uh, Nicholas Bretel vehicle. In the end of "Don't Look Up," don't the two uh, don't the two broadcasters do they end up fucking or do they end up just getting drunk and sh- talking shit about people? I think it's the latter, actually. I don't remember. I doesn't they, she I, say? I want to say they fuck again. as well, or no, they used to fuck or something. I don't know. So, something like, but the thing of like before the ship sinks, so to speak, you want these two to do it or whatever. Yeah. I like that we got Greg and uh, and Tom to slap each other around a little bit. I thought that was amazing, especially being it being in like close quarters in a bathroom. <laughs> Just Perfect. like it's so good. Greg's um, dumbass not knowing that when he's being called into the bathroom that yeah. he's like, I just need you behind a closed door so I can beat the shit out of you. That was I'm a little torn on the Greg, uh, Greg and Tom thing because I. I was very excited for a few seconds when I thought that it, at at the finish line, Greg was going to fuck Tom and like just take away everything that he has ever wanted. Like his ultimate dream was an inch from the finish line and Greg, the kid that he took under his wing for some reason, ended up fucking him over. Like because I was it's so worth excited noting, by that. It's worth noting. We don't know that he knew he was fucking over Tom. 
He d- I don't know. I don't th- no, he did he, he did it. He knew he was fucking over Matson. He knew that he right. was just yeah. spying. Because Matt because he knew Matson was gonna fuck over Shiv and he that's felt like all he knew. That's all he knew. So and then he, he called Kendall and he the said, role. Hey, yeah. check on right. this. Kendall asked around, found out, yeah, okay. But even because, then they didn't know that it was Tom, Tom. didn't tell him. Tom, right. Tom was very coy about it. He's like, We're gonna be good. Like it, so uh, that I definitely didn't like I think him unknowingly fucking over Tom would have been so funny. So, so funny. But I am glad that if he wasn't going to fuck him over, that Tom wasn't going to hold it against Greg. Like, he wasn't going to be like, fuck you, you're dead to me. Greg doing something unknowingly makes sense dramaturgically. Yes, absolutely. And, and that's, that's just all I wanted throughout the show. Like, I didn't want it to be... And I'm not one of these finale guys, truly. I'm not the like, oh, the finale wasn't a, a great episode. The finale wasn't its best episode. Therefore, that show sucked. Or therefore, that show's legacy is tarnished. Even if I were, if I thought there was a lot riding on this finale, I'd come away from it being like, yo, nailed it. If there were 10 points up for grabs, you got, I don't know, like eight and a half to 10 of them. Yeah, I mean, uh, as long as they stuck again, like as long as they stuck with the characters that we that they've been painting for three, four years, I think that it would have been a good finale. The only way that I would have been disappointed would have been like erasing two or three years worth of work, where it's like, okay, this isn't the character that you built up, you know, and like it, it, it's it, it, they just really stuck the landing so well, and I we talked about this line back when. Um, you know, it, it had happened. And I remember you saying like, I didn't like the Logan line. Uh, I love you, but you're not serious people. You are unserious people. Um, like I thought you it was like, meme baiting. you're like, you're like, yeah, you, you said I, this is like clearly written for the memes and stuff. And at the time I was like, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, but like now I think that's the most important line of this entire season because it lit- it came true in the finale where it's like the two kids realized they're not serious people. And, and, um, and, uh, Roman really spelled it out where he was just like, dude, this is all bullshit. We, we are bullshit. We are this, this isn't for us. This is bullshit. We were born into this. We're playing fucking games and it doesn't like, it doesn't matter that we're, it doesn't matter if we lose. It doesn't matter if we win. This is all fucking bullshit. And he was just, he just wanted out. He just wanted to stop playing. So and- I- I'll have to check. I fired up season one the other day. I want to say in the first or second episode, somebody says something about being serious people. Mm -hmm. And I think it's Roman. I think that Roman says like, so-and-so isn't a serious person or like, we're not serious people or like something that I was, that, that by the time Tom, uh, yeah, I mean, I assume with anything that they're just making fun of (laughs) Tom or something, but the, the listeners, if if you know who it was, somebody at some point in season one says something about not being serious people. Uh, I thought the writing in this this episode and this season were the best of the entire run. I just I just think that like everything worked, and like even when they were talking about like how uh, Logan had promised it to or like made a commitment to each one of them at one point during the series that like that he wanted them to be the person that took over like that to me and they didn't like explicitly say it but like that to me says that he he wanted to give it to his kids but at at some point and he made the commitment to each one of his kids and at some point he realized they weren't going to be able to do it they weren't serious serious people and so them going through it and them making their case based off of like well dad said this or did this for me and so that means i deserve it yeah, he made all those promises, but he never followed through because none of you deserved it. Speaking and... of the speaking of the writing, and you mentioned uh, scenes where it was the three kids together at nine forty four p.m. Eastern time. I had an anxiety attack, and Jesse Armstrong and Mark Mylod, you you know what you did, you know what you were doing, having everything look like it was working out all right, and the kids were all playing nice, and then they decide to go in the water. Mm-hmm. I was freaking out the entire time that Shiv and Roman were talking, especially about killing uh, Kendall. 
as Kendall is in the water. Were you yeah. freaking out during that? No, I actually didn't make that. Uh, I didn't make even make that connection. At oh, all. I'm so jealous. I yeah. was freaking. I had I had out. it like about ten minutes later when obviously the final scene takes place near water, and you're like, oh boy. Yeah, they they, they knew what they did. That was for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I yeah. the the only text I sent during that show was actually I responded to a text from you saying there were some HBO issues. That that stinks. Uh, I felt bad. It also is. Uh, it's quite funny that um, both both Succession and Barry. Um, I saw quotes from the actors that played um, uh, obviously Kendall and then uh, Gene Cousineau. There are both um, questions about whether those two characters would commit suicides in their respect for, respective finale. And I think that both of the actors that played them said they're too egotistical to commit suicide. They I agree think with that. that they are important to the world uh, too much to kill themselves. I think th I agree with that more in the case of Cousineau. Kendall than I do oh, in Cousineau. Really? I think really? that Cousineau, I, no, I, I think that Cousineau thinks that it's like uh, Shakespeare, it's Shakespearean. Yeah, it, but I don't know. I, I think that, I think that Kendall is more, is more impulsive or like more destructive yeah, I, than Cousineau is. I hear what you're you're saying. Uh, I I loved the Barry finale. It was it, like I don't love that it ended up ending with the story being told that way. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how much sense that made dramaturgically for me, but I do. I did love the first uh, ten fifteen minutes of it. Um, I uh, I thought it was underwhelming in some aspects, like the uh, I thought that the Hank. Um, the Hank and uh, shit. What's what's his name? Uh, the, well, the Raven. The Raven. Fugues. Yeah. Fugues. Yeah. Hank and Fugues showdown left a little bit to be desired. It was just like very quick and. It was very... the Breaking Bad Hank death, though. Yeah. I liked that. That's yeah, like it, it that's was... how it would look if a bunch of dudes yeah. are standing around with guns. Yeah. Once one fires, one within three seconds, everyone's dead. I think overall, like the way that they told the story, I thought worked really well, and I liked that like. Yeah, obviously there's no happy ending here and the way that they told it is like so dark and bleak that like Barry ends up being the hero of I know. all of this is just like it's so dark and this was a oh this was a very dark show beginning to end and so I don't know like I I like that it stuck with that and I like that Cousineau ended up being even more of a like tortured victim than anybody could have possibly imagined. I would more say a tragic hero because there was a ton of hubris with Cousineau. If Cousineau weren't so vain, none of this happens. Or not none of this happens, but a lot of this doesn't happen. Oh yeah, I mean of course, but like like he you know, sealed it... his fa like basically like think of think of in the basketball episode of The Office, Jim's dribbling the ball and Jim is trying to ruin Cousineau's life. And then here comes Dwight, who is Gene Cousineau trying to ruin Gene Cousineau's life and steals the ball from Barry or Jim. Like, that, there's th these wheels are in motion already to try to do doom this guy, and Cousineau goes out of his way to accelerate it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean for sure. Like, that's – you could also say the same for, um, for Sally. Like, Sally and Gene both kind of ruin their own lives by their desperation to be relevant and desperation mm -hmm. to like get to the top in any way possible and just kind of like be they're basically they're essentially star fuckers. Um and like Barry is the star. Um and but like it's still like both of those people were largely minding their own business when we met them. And uh so for like Gene's life to be ruined is is a little sad. I need to for sure sad. I need to say my favorite part of the episode, which was in the Mass Collector, the film made about the Barry Berkman story, which was a Gene Cousineau uh, um, line. That's what he said. He like an actor needs to be a mass collector. Oh, that's okay. I was wondering where that came from. All right, so uh, when Cousineau has this showdown with Barry at the end of the movie. Cousineau takes out a, a handgun, like a, a six shooter or something. Mm -hmm. 
and pumps 10 in him. Yeah. <laughs> I went back and counted. <laughs> Shoots him 10 it's times. It's so good. Which I know shit about guns. I know but fuck all But a six shooter is pretty self-explanatory that, there. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that was a six shooter. There were not 10 bullets in that gun. But the that slow was... motion of Barry getting 10 pumped in him was so funny. I, I think, like, my favorite part of the finale is how much Kusuno would have fucking hated that movie. <laughs> Absolutely hated that movie. It's just like, and just spitting on that guy's grave to make that movie. Like, even in even in death, that guy can't get a win. That is so true. Because he ends up getting, uh, uh, was it you earlier in this conversation? Or it could, I'm sorry, I've discussed with a few people uh, that said... Like Kusuno got what he wanted in the end. He got a bunch of attention. No, no, because like me. this yeah. would be that that movie. Truly, you are right. That would be his nightmare. Yeah, I mean, a poorly acted movie. <laughs> everything is just it's just very so cheap, cheap and hackneyed. Yeah, yeah. just uh, all the just... shots of Barry on stage and everything just horrible. The man, the delivery of some of the lines though, amazing. You're a soldier. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll do what you're told. <laughs> and he's like very Shakespearean, like yeah. really British. <laughs> it's very funny. Super. Also, like a, it was community theater people made a movie. It tripped me up that um the kid who plays Will. Bar yeah, what? Is that Will from Stranger Things? It is not, no. That plays um, the son? Yeah, it's not him. It's Are you uh, sure? It's, yes. It's the kid who plays um one of the kids from it. That's it. Um, I knew yeah. it was one of those fucking yeah, he, he, white he kid plays, movies. So he plays the kid. He plays uh, one of the kids from It, but he doesn't play the kid who grows up to be Bill Hader. He grow, he plays the kid who grows up to be James McAvoy. And so that really tripped me up because mm -hmm. the kid from Stranger Things, uh, Finn Wolfhard, grows up to be Bill Hader in It too. Wow. So like there was just like a lot of like kind of interchanging parts there. And who who ends up being? Uh, oh man, I feel terrible. I can't remember Ziggy's name. Uh, in uh, from uh, the Wire. Yeah. Um, Shoot. He, he was. He hold on. He was in the uh, what's it called? The the Black Phone. I'm gonna uh, be so mad when I find his name. Uh, come on. Ah, uh, James Ransone. Oh, yeah, yeah, But what does he have to do with anything? He's in it. He's one of the adults in it. Yeah, but you're just like... The kid who, with who, the... Uh, yeah, the kid, the with... kid who plays him. <laughs> like, yeah. that kid is not part of the discussion. <laughs> yeah. I thought we were just discussing that sometimes <laughs> in it, the kids grow up and then they become... That's hey, speaking right. of it, uh, great act. I, I, I feel bad that uh, because everyone's on board that Kieran Culkin was great in season four of Succession mm -hmm. Train... Uh, they're only talking about Kieran Culkin, which I don't want to do the whole like, oh, you're just talking about this, but you're missing this thing. But like, obviously, goes out saying Jeremy Strong, one of the best TV acting performances ever. Kendall, he was the the heartbeat of that show. Sarah mm -hmm. Snook was so good, obviously from beginning to end, but she was great in that last episode. Uh, Alexander Skarsgård, so good in this past episode and wasn't in it a ton, but his scene with Tom excellent i thought that his scene with phones i want to see fucking yeah. phones you saw a lot of layers to that for guy. me man yeah, you saw a lot of layers to that character madsen yeah. was all over the place but i think in a designed way and uh and he played him like so believably and yeah. one of the one of the guys that we haven't even mentioned which is very funny because we talked about last week um fisher stevens uh hugo hugo yeah yeah so we were saying like if anybody's gonna be okay it's hugo Hugo was the first one on the chopping block once the uh, the sale went through. They were like, you got to get rid of Hugo. And you know who is absolutely him? Carolina. Carolina yeah. is him, dude. Like Making moves early. Making moves in silence, in, in the shadows. Like, Hugo was front and center. Like, I'm, I'm trying to make moves here. Carolina had the knife ready to go. Yeah. That was amazing when Hugo says, like, hey, I was hoping it would be you. Yeah. And he's like, hey, yeah, have you seen Carolina? Yeah, that was so good. Ah, oh, man, Hugo. Didn't no get spine. called a C-bomb, though. No spine. Didn't Who got get called, called a C-bomb? Carolina? Frank and Carl. Oh, did they call Carolina a C-bomb? No. 
No, Tom called Frank and Carl a C bomb. Oh, well, can't blame him there. They Yo, were the it... first one they were the first ones to shit in his mouth as soon to as Logan his face. died. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right, right to his face. No. And what I love about whatsoever. it is in that scene where Frank and Carl were being so mean to him, mm -hmm. Jerry was too. But yeah. she's just fucking good. She's good like that, man. Did you notice, by the way, uh what Roman did after the sale went through? He got a drink. What did he get? Uh, dirty martini. He went and got a martini. That's what Jerry's always drinking. Really? That's his. That was his little like. Fuck, I, like this is my last little. The only grasp thing of I, this. The only thing that I like failed to comprehend or failed to wrap my head around a little bit was like his meltdown when Jerry walked into the office, and I don't know if that was just like he didn't want to see, he didn't want Jerry to see him like kind of have like a limp dick and give it to give it to Ken. Hmm. Because like he immediately reverted to like why isn't why can't it be me right. why can't it be me like so I, I think that he was just I think that he's like very very self conscious about people's perception of him. Hmm. Oh yeah, absolutely. But but welcome to being uh welcome to being a Roy. All right. Yeah. This, but, uh, but like but his but his like because I, I can't quite figure out. I think Roman still has a lot of mystery to him, and I can't figure out whether it's like he's he has like little brother syndrome where he doesn't want to be seen as lesser than, than any of the other kids. Yeah. But that's, that goes funnily with his we're bullshit thing because he is right. And he does seem to have that mindset throughout the whole thing of like, we're not to be taken seriously. This is only, this only has value because idiots have ascribed value but, to it. But his thing is, we're all bullshit. So, like right. when Ken, when Ken was about to get the chair, I think that he kind of had that fear kick in, where he's like, "Okay, I, I think that I'm bullshit, but is Ken not bullshit? Like, am I inferior to Ken? Oh Ken's no, getting this. He's known for sure the whole time that, like, I, I think that he agrees with Shiv that, yeah, I don't think Kendall's going to be very good at this but nobody in that family could think that kendall was going to be good at no, no kendall couldn't think that shiv would be good at it because no. they've seen who's good at it and it's logan and nobody there is logan they don't know another human like logan and that's kendall's uh little uh speech thing that he says at the birthday party they have the episode before or whatever they're doing something for uh logan uh i think that that's he, kind of the Go ahead, funeral sorry. when he says um when he says that like what a monster he was, but God, I hope I have that in me, mm -hmm. sort of thing. Like and I, I think they all know. Like we 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 can't we can't be like him. I don't think they know that though. Like or at least they they didn't before the final episode. I, I think that that's like the big takeaway here, and that's why I like the finale so much is because, like, it just tells you the message. Like you, it's you, you're not like that's not passed down. That gene and like those those the ability to do that and and sit in that chair is not just passed down it's not inherited you have to like you have to be able to do it and none of those kids had it in them you know what our biggest problem is right now we currently have zero hope davis shows that's true hope i it's very funny that hope davis's dad uh what's his name um oh shit uh sandy sandy mm -hmm. outlived and like was still there in oh the yes, in the finale. Even though he's been a vegetable for like two years, at this outlived point. Logan. Good call. Yeah. Outlived Logan and possibly Jimmy, and still had a board seat and st was still voting. <laughs> yeah, you know who was a great character in that show and Stewie. doesn't get a ton of credit? Stewie. Stewie's the best. Stewie was so good, man. And like it always, Stewie always had a swing vote. Always, yeah. he had so much power. Stewie's a Stewie's a meatball sub where like of course everyone knows a stew uh, meatball sub is the best, but you just don't think to get a meatball sub all the time. Mm -hmm. As long as you think about Stewie, you know he rocks. Yeah. Okay, now for the fun stuff. Now for the fucking uh, fake clip. All right, this is gonna be a clip that's uh, breaking down the uh, Succession uh, series finale. You should have seen, uh, listeners. You should have seen. The, uh, the brainstorming session that we had trying to work through this this clip off the air. We couldn't find an ending, and now this puts pressure on had the Had to ending. really work for the punchline. All right, you're going to read the Kendall seemed sad line, 
And I'm going to edit this all together anyway. So if you have to do like takes of each line, whatever. Okay. Uh, and then you'll do the, well, he kept talking about his mugs every time. So your comeback to what I say is, well, he kept talking about his mugs. And every time people told him to stop, he either got really sad or he started yelling about his mugs. <laughs> okay. So I'm starting with... Uh, with Kendall Casey. seems okay. sad. Okay. All right, here we go. <sighs> Kendall seems sad. Kendall was so sad this episode. Yeah, he kept trying to talk to everybody about his mugs, but nobody wanted to listen to him about his mugs. Now do a... Uh, Hold on. Do a, Well, let's, he kept talking about his mugs. Yeah. Yeah, all right. Let's, let's redo it. Yep. It's from the top. All right, here we go. Kendall seems sad. Kendall was really sad this episode. Yeah, he kept trying to talk to everybody about his mugs, but every time he brought up his mugs, he either got he was either yelling about his mugs or he just seemed really, really sad. Do it as though you're like, well, what do you expect? Like, okay. well, he kept talking about his mugs, and every time okay. he told every time they told him to stop, he'd get sad, or then he or he'd yell about the mugs. All right, that makes sense yeah. dramaturgically. Yeah. Um, Kendall seems sad. Kendall was really sad this episode. Yeah, well, he kept trying to talk to everybody about his mugs, and every time he brought up his mugs, everybody, nobody wanted to hear it, and he would just get angry and yell about it. <laughs> I think we nailed that take. Yeah. Do actually do do one more. Uh, uh, starting from, and whenever they told him to stop, and whenever they told him to stop, he'd either get really sad or start yelling about his mugs. And whenever they told him to stop, he would either get yelled at or he would yell and get mad or sad about his mugs. <laughs> Just covered a lot of around there. That one was uh, that one I like because it's like very. Uh, I think you should leave. It's very we're, exasperated. We're, and, and like you said, you said the words wrong. You said whenever they, whenever they told him to stop, he would get yelled at. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna say, was Roman dinky? And you're gonna say, yeah, he was really dinky. Uh. Uh, yeah, he was super dinky. Was Roman dinky? Yeah, dude, he was super. Uh, that was that was. He, he was super di- like yeah, like yeah, I yeah. thought you'd make that point kind mm-hmm, of thing. Mm-hmm. Was Roman dinky? Yeah, he was super dinky. Now go. Uh, well, at the beginning of the episode, by the end he was pretty huge. <laughs> well, I mean, at the beginning of the episode, at the end he was huge. <laughs> Do it like you're reassuring. Like, at the end, he was huge. At the beginning of the episode. By the end, he was pretty huge. Yeah. At the, at the beginning of the episode, but at the end, he was pretty huge. Love it. All right. Um, all right. Uh, so now, I'm going to say, you go too much fire. when. <laughs> What about Connor? Too much fire. Too much fire? Too much fire. No. Uh, I'm going to say that's con air. Uh, that's con air. What did you say? Connor. Oh, yeah. Well, Connor was fine. In the end, Tom got what he wanted. That scene with a car? Tom got a race car bed. Yep. Tom at the end gets what he wants. Yeah, and I mean it was it was pretty crazy to see Shiv finally relent and and finally give it to him. That car scene. Yep. Tom he, got a race car bed. And that race car bed. <laughs> Wanted it the whole time. All right, we'll be able to get something out of that. <laughs> now for a second one. Ted Lasso. I'm very excited for this one. I, I'm, I'm kind of going in blind to this one. Yeah. Haven't really workshopped this one at all. This one is more, this one sticks more to the like script of the last two. <laughs> you say how and then ah when I answer your question. Okay. Okay. There's a fan theory that Ted is secretly working for Rupert. What? How? He's putting stuff in the biscuits. Fucking with her, making her act all weird. Mm. He's got her doing monster faces in the mirror, fucking players falling into water. And if you notice, Ted never eats the biscuits himself. Or if he eats the biscuits, they're different ones or something. Do, where'd you see this? <laughs> where'd you see this? It's uh, it's a fan theory. Do 
yeah, do again. Uh, uh, where'd you see this? <laughs> where'd you see this? It's it's a fan theory. Where? It's, it's fans. Uh, <laughs> and you know what the secret ingredient is? What? Barbecue sauce. <laughs> All right, back to being a real podcast. Boy, editing those even for... Because I'm going to edit those into the social clips. Mm -hmm. But also, I'll have to tidy them up so even like the takes of them, listeners will be able to tolerate. God, editing that will will stink. Editing is the worst. Yeah, we're currently uh, editing ourselves, although we... uh, I got to talk to you. I have an idea about uh, editing stuff. Uh, Patreon.com slash uh, listen to brunch. I like that that's now just become our vocalized pause. What? <laughs> Patreon.com slash listen to brunch? Yeah. No, well, that was relevant. Just like give us money and I, I, I don't know. I, everyone's got a guy. We have we have uh, Spike. Spike's probably not listening to this episode. We should toss some bones at Spike. And when we're done with these, I've I've been editing these for a few months now. Mm-hmm. Uh, It'd be nice this summer and just with like stuff we've got going on to not make like the entire second half of the day brunch stuff. But that, is, that's only from a timing standpoint. I like editing the stuff. I, it just takes I, up a lot of time. I do too. It's very time consuming. And the, the, I, the it's weird to say, but like getting a second camera would make the editing process easier based right. off of the program that we that we've started using. And so... Maybe that's the next big purchase for the Patreon um, is to invest in a second camera and do a straight up two camera show. Yeah, and I think it'll look a lot better. Um, so I, th- I think that 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 is the next step. For now us. I'm so fucking nervous. I could throw up over these two clips if are, they don't you go. Worried, are you worried that they're not gonna? If they don't go, we're fucked. We're not gonna. We're not gonna bat a thousand all the time. Don't talk to a person who's batting a thousand. <laughs> Why wouldn't we? Yeah, I, I guess. Both are well. I mean, we're already starting from behind here. We're not talking about Taylor Swift. I know, and I was thinking, I was like, could we put Taylor Swift stuff into them? I think that we can apply the what works in those things to other things. Nora had the right idea. She was just like, I'm going to do a whole goddamn show about Taylor Swift. Yeah, but hers is sincere, right? And it's smart. Like, yeah, she's not. Yeah, but I'm just saying, like, that's like starting on third base. The world would be fucked if. We didn't have Nora. Truly. Yeah. Like, if somebody else had that, if somebody else were in charge of doing the Taylor Swift talk, yeah. Uh, I, I don't like some of the other options that could <laughs> be out there. They're like, probably I, out I, there, you know. As a, a music fan and a uh, Taylor Swift fan, I feel like Shiv being like, wait, who's going to be in charge of the company? It's important that somebody smart. And capable is in charge of that company. I'm um I'm pretty glad that uh that that Nora is like our Taylor Swift Olmsbud Olmsbudman. Um, Olms, that's it. Olmsbuds Olmsboop mm-hmm. Olmsba mm-hmm. Bobsman uh, <laughs> Bobsman. Yes. Um. Yeah. I'm glad that that Nora has that role. Uh. Her. I. I do feel a little bit bad for her boss this week. Uh, our, uh, our old guy, I know. B- Billy Sports, friend of the podcast, Bill Simmons, got caught in a little bit of Celtics crossfire in Game Seven. I felt really bad. I he, think that he has embraced it, though. Has he? I haven't. I haven't yeah, I think he was it. like, yeah, that's what. I, that's how I felt. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, like, there, there's no other reaction that you can have, and like that. That honestly makes Bill Simmons more endearing to me. Is that like he could easily just be like. Uh, like at this point in his career, he could be like a fucking like Mark Wahlberg who just like, yeah, I'm from Boston. But like Mark Wahlberg doesn't give a shit about any Boston sports team. Famously, Bill he's Simmons, a Dallas star and Vegas Golden Knights fan. <laughs> big series for him. He, yeah. came, he came out on top. He plays yeah. ball side. So he always comes out. All on he top. does is win. Yep. Uh, no, like Bill Simmons. The fact that like he's still that that emotionally invested and still like a true fan uh, like hell yeah uh, and like the fact that he was with his dad he was probably very upset for his dad yeah his dad's a season ticket holder that i love that about the celtics uh do you know who mike zarin is yeah that's he's the same way and he is the assistant general manager of the celtics now he just like watches the games uh with his dad in their seats it, there's something about celtics i know that not everybody listening to this podcast loves sports but let's be real you can't love 
ninety percent of the shit that we talk about on here. Like, I, anyway, uh, I love that that exists with the Celtics, and we for sure don't have the celebrities that they when they show people courtside and everything. Although, shout out a uh, friend of the podcast, Jack Harlow, was there mm-hmm. last night, which. Good for him that he stays loyal to the Celtics. He likes the Celtics. He likes Jason Tatum, but he's obviously got some friends on the Heat. So I thought that it was cool that he came up and showed up for the Celtics. And famously, he he can't jump. Mm, so it's true. It's cool that he was out there checking out. Uh, well, I mean, that maybe that's the problem. He couldn't jump off the bandwagon. Oh, maybe. Do you see his jacket? It was pretty dope. His jacket was very good, but not as good as, do you see Jason Tatum's jacket? Mm, no, I don't think so. He had a Kevin Garnett shack it and i famously did not want the celtics to trade for kevin garnett i wanted them to build around al jefferson good call dave uh (laughs) but kevin garnett until any of these guys win is and i was alive for larry bird but i was too young kevin garnett is the best celtic of my life that guy just fucking wrong oh yeah of your life for sure he was their best player and he was super mean to everybody else on the other team well he was the he was like the you know we talk about matthew kachuk changing the culture of the florida panthers yes kevin garnett changed the culture of the boston celtics in a way that he just turned them all into murderers (laughs) he just turned them all into just like bad fucking dudes man he anyway uh the fashion was good for the celtics but the vibes were not and they they lost. Yeah, I, I don't get the... Uh, and a lot of Celtics fans sometimes will clown on the... Like, everybody in the media who's related to the Celtics, where, like, maybe because they're media, they don't belong anymore. Like, I see Celtics... I've, I, the last couple of weeks, I've seen Celtics fans complaining about Kevin O'Connor. If you complain about Kevin O'Connor, who's, well, like, A, did... the best basketball writer, and B, nicest fucking dude in the world. I, I mean, I, I think that, that that probably stemmed from the his report that, like, yeah. they don't like each other. Yeah, well, fuck, the media doesn't make stuff up, man. That guy, that guy no more, knows more than we do. Uh, I, I mean, the, the Simmons thing, I, I would assume, like, any sort of, like, ill will towards Simmons is, like, him now being a West Coast guy and being, like, a Clippers season ticket holder. But, like... What do you want him to do? That's stupid. I love Clippers games, man. Yeah, good. I like Bill Simmons more now if he's a Cle- uh, Clippers season ticket he is holder. A Clippers season ticket holder. So if he is, that's a smart play because that's a tough list to crack for like the celebs that get on the jumbotron. You got to be Lakers game. Huge shit at a Lakers or Knicks game. You also have a lot to a lot, spend a lot more money, and if you don't care about the Lakers. And you're just like kind of wanting to see basketball. Yeah. Being a Clippers season ticket holder, you get to see all the same teams. Yeah. I I respect a Clippers season ticket holder because they're paying face value for Clippers tickets. And yeah, every time yeah. I've gotten Clippers tickets, I've gotten like amazing seats for three dollars. The only Clippers fans that I know, like celebrity wise, Bill Simmons, who I wouldn't even consider a Clippers fan, he's just like in that bubble but the guy from uh workaholics Mm -hmm. who is not one of the three main guys but the uh like the bigger older dude with the mustache oh yeah yeah, yeah. he's like a diehard clippers fan really yeah interesting uh january jones i think is a clippers fan really yeah okay huge get (laughs) huge get (laughs) huge get for the clips best acquisition since paul george um if if I lived in L.A., I could maybe adopt the Clippers as like a West Coast team, but I do like I like some teams out West. I root I I, I pull for the uh, I I lightly pull for the Trailblazers. I wanted them to win the I wanted them to get Victor Wembanyama. So friend of the podca- podcast, John uh, Titterington could have a great player. Although I read a thing from a uh, great Celtics writer, Danger Cart. He's saying the Celtics are going to be fucked money wise, which is no surprise that maybe they trade Jalen Brown. And if they trade Jalen Brown, he was putting out some scenarios. Dame Lillard. And so Dame is one that people float around, but he said, What if you trade him to uh the Spurs? And I was like, yo, as an NBA, as a Celtics fan, I'd be sad. But as an NBA fan, that would rock. If from the gate, if like from the jump in the Victor Wembanyama era. They also had Jalen Brown with Pop. They would be fucking sick. Who would you get back in that trade to San Antonio? Uh, they, they have a point guard. I forget his name. Uh, De- Devin something. Devin Booker. De- yeah, Devin Booker. <laughs> it would be a three-way trade. They'd get <laughs> Devin Booker back. 
Yeah, I don't know, man. I'm fucking sad about the Celtics, though, because they they, they hurt me more than... So, like, the Tom Shiv thing, when Tom says, like, you can, like, hurt me more than anybody else can sort of thing, the Celtics can make me feel worse than any other team I like can. Okay. Why? Because the Bruins, I pull for more than I am a fan because the Bruins, there's that was like my job for so long. Uh, I still pull for them and I'm sad when they lose. But also that that's also like I'm sad for my friends kind of thing. Celtics, the, pa- the Patriots, uh, their fans are really annoying. And that was also work a lot, but I still do really uh, pull for them. I've, I, I like everyone that I know like related to the team. Celtics was never really work for me. Celtics was always like I got in. I I was a Celtics fan growing up and everything, but I didn't get crazy into them until friend of the podcast Rich started bringing me to games. So that's just like a totally purely fan thing. And then the Revs, that's also a purely fan thing. So like I'll I'll be more bummed out about one of those two teams losing than I will about the others but yeah i mean uh, like the celtics are like dessert to me where like the the bruins are like the dinner like they're my main course Mm. and the celtics are a little bit of dessert so like if the celtics are doing well i'm very very excited about it as like an additional little treat Mm -hmm. but it's like if if i don't have the celtics i'm not gonna be like i'm not gonna feel like anything's missing but i do really like like basketball culture and like celtics culture in particular oh yeah where it's there's just like I don't know. Like, there's something, uh, the, the, the like watching a basketball game or like getting into basketball just has a different feeling. Like the community, it just feels different. Mm-hmm. Just like everybody's excited about basketball, mm. and I don't, I don't know. It's it's hard to like, it's hard to specify, but there is sort of like this aura around basketball that like everybody thinks it's a very special thing th- and i can get excited about that the thing that the celtics have on every other team in boston is the atmosphere i i know bruins so fans are is. like nothing can get crazier than a bruins game so blah blah like every big bruins game that has happened in like our listeners lifetimes i've like i would say like 95 percent of them i've attended there is Nothing like the garden for a Celtics game for any big moment. And it's because they're not fucking playing music. So it's like if Tatum hits a huge fucking shot and it's just like JT for three, like that, that beats everything. I, so it's insane correct, how loud it is. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like the Celtics have the most like the smart. Mm, shut up uh have like the smartest the smartest fan base in terms of like realism and understanding their own team like celtics are very very positive no matter what so that's very very positive that's what what i mean like they're very positive and like the air around them is very positive but when things are are going wrong like it's it's assessed correctly for the most part I think you are giving friend of the podcast Rich too much credit. I think like the Celtics fans you know okay. are like that. Uh, the re- like the reaction to Kevin O'Connor saying I, like the, the vibes around the team aren't great. People, people who could not possibly know were like, "No, you're making that up." Why? <laughs> You've never like at work the vibes have never not been great. Like that's that's a thing that happens in life. I do like I, the, my my exposure to Celtics fan it, fans is pretty limited to like people that I like. Yeah. So those are people that I'm typically giving the benefit of the doubt to. But I don't know. Like there there does seem to be like a more positive energy around the Celtics, even when things aren't going super duper well. Like it seems like there's a well. We can turn this around. I'm even like that. I'm, I mean, with the Celtics, I'm always like, I God, I fucking love them so much, though. So I, I'll have the like, God damn it, how like they had no fucking business losing the series that they just lost, and I was not looking. I was never looking at it like, wow, what a great comeback this would be, or oh my God, Miami, how could you blow this or whatever. Like everything was just like, you're so much better than them. You should win. So when they lost, I was like. Well, they fucking blew that. That's me thinking 
that they fucking rock, though. So mm-hmm. am I really hating? I don't know. I compared it last night uh, to if a band you love starts working with a bad producer and you're like, wait a second, and then they put out a junk album, you go like, Lord, why the fuck did you do that? Yeah, man? you don't say the band sucks. You're like, ah, you're not working with the right people here. You're like, Lord, how could you do this to me, Lord? I had a big music tweet this week. Oh, you did? You tweeted about uh, the uh, uh, famous 1997 uh, Fleetwood Mac live album, The Dance. The Dance. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's actually like this goes back quite far in podcast lore because yeah. in like the early stages of this sh- this podcast, we did a lot of talk about Silver Springs and how oh, it's yeah. a great old song. Speaking of tattoos that uh, I never got. What, the uh, Mick Fleetwood? No, I was going to get a tattoo that said uh, uh, Silver Springs is a great little oh, song. Really? Yeah. I do remember at one point in time you said you were going to get a Mick Fleetwood, uh, like the like the, the, his stance on the dance cover. Oh, did well, I? Yeah, you said that you were going to get that, and I was like, that would be an awesome tattoo. Um, <laughs> Ridiculous. Which still, you should still consider that. But no, I tweeted out that the uh, the the last two minutes of uh, of Silver Springs on the dance – is the best two minutes in music history mm. with the video of Stevie Nicks and Lindsey Buckingham just staring daggers at each other. And like, I, I didn't expect anything from it. I just wanted to like put that out there as like, hey, I'm really obsessed with this right now. Yeah. And people were like, there was a lot of like, yeah, it is. You did it the right way too. You didn't do the like, hey, are we talking about Fleetwood Mac enough? Uh, but I was surprised. So I went in there to respond with some jokey stuff uh, of like, this is a better two minutes in some like ridiculous uh, like clip you've never seen before. But a lot of the responses were like, wow, what's this? Yeah, and I'm like, dude. What? <laughs> That's like the most. Like, I, I remember living through that, not really caring about it. Then getting back into Fleetwood Mac as an adult and being like, this is the greatest moment in my life. I need to know everything about it. Learning that it was staged. And what we're talking about is uh, there's a song from the uh, 1977 Fleetwood Mac album, Rumors, called uh, Silver Springs. That's by Stevie Nicks. And it's about Lindsey Buckingham. And that's like her song to him. His song to her is Go Your Own Way, which is basically like, hey, fuck you, lady. I don't like you anymore. Go fuck whoever you want. Fuck, fuck, fuck but they don't swear in the song. Uh, and this was Stevie's kind of song to him. The it rebuttal. Did, yeah, it didn't make the album. They cut it. In Nonsense. St- and instead put... Uh, they said it didn't fit the tempo or like the, the they just, too slow for rumors they i something like they there's always some fucking excuse though yeah like of we course, yeah. if if one of us comes up with an idea the other one doesn't like you come We're up not with gonna say why, hey, this fucking sucks <laughs> yeah you don't just say i don't want to put it on the thing you just say oh i think that it needs this and you hype up whatever anyway uh the original recording of it which you can find is fucking amazing but uh when they it's did a, a little different than the than yeah, the dance version when they did a uh a reunion tour in 1997 i believe 94 was the eagles 97 i think was fleetwood mac uh they did some quote unquote new songs and they each did maybe one or two and silver springs was one of stevie's and they put that out as a single and at the end Stevie turns to face Lindsay as she sings the lyrics that are uh, uh, time casts a spell on you, but you won't forget me. I know I could have loved you, but you uh, would not let me. I'll follow you down till the sound of my voice will haunt you. You'll never get away from the voice of the woman that loves you. And they're looking at each other and they're having the most sex two people standing 20 feet apart have ever had uh, with each other. Like angry sex. Just like really. And they've said that. That was like part of the show and it was staged and everything. But, and I definitely believe them. But when I watch that, no, I don't. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was like, if this is staged, which, you know, there is probably an element that, like, hey, we'll play this up. But, that, like, yeah. But, I, like, if they're acting, they deserve Oscars because you can, you can only go so far with acting. There's, there's truth behind those eyes. I think that There's ha- pain behind those eyes. I think that half of it is them tapping into a real thing, and the other half is they get you half of the way, and you pull it the other half. You're like, I want to believe it, please, and you fill it in. And it is still, even when you posted it, and I knew it was coming, uh, I still got goosebumps watching it. Yeah, it's like watching like a 
uh, an old sports highlight that like meant a lot to you or like you know that it like has a really high height and mm. you, you know how it ends but you're like oh i, I gotta see it again like Derek white I putting back again. that uh that's right marcus smart shot um but yeah i've, I've like um I, I i've always loved silver springs just from a song perspective and I did know the backstory of it, but I've like recently been getting more into like just like reading about uh, about Fleetwood Mac lore. Awesome, and it's it's like makes me appreciate it so much more. And I'm just been on like a massive Fleetwood Mac kick recently, and like a song that has never really registered with me before until now is uh um never going back again that's oh. just fucking rules. You want a, a Lindsay to Stevie song. That is a great song and a very, very, very difficult song to play on guitar. I would imagine so. Like, I don't know anything about guitar. I don't know. But, like, it seems like a very hard... Well, Pete, he's uh, implementing a technique called Travis picking. And that is when uh, you're playing the bass notes with the thumb. It's it's a finger picking technique. And you're, uh, doing, uh, you're doing the thumb... At one rhythm, so he's going bop, 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 and with the other fingers, he's doing da 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 da. So they're kind of playing off against each other, and you try to do it, and you're telling your thumb to do this while your fingers are doing very, very tricky to do. I would imagine so. Like even listening to that song, I'm like, wow, this is something that I've never really heard before. And he's doing it while screaming his heart out. Ah. Been down one time. Yeah. Been down A little two flat times. there. But been down one time. There you go. Never yeah. going back again. I'm never going back again. God. Mm. He's the best. And then yeah, then that that, mm. that classic Fleetwood Mac Christine Stevie. And that, that's what I love about it though. Like he's doing this song, motherfucking Stevie, and then he's like, hold on. It stopped. Stevie, can you come sing on this, please? All right, don't uh, just take off the headphones, and I'll just point to you when you go. Mm, you don't want to. You're not going to want to hear this. <laughs> <laughs> and man, th- th- that album's fucking great. And because uh, you make love and fun yeah. by uh, Christine McVie mm-hmm. is about their like uh, like light sky. Really? Yeah. Fucking the light sky. So she's like, John, will you come play bass on this one? <laughs> Cool. I'm, it's about me fucking that guy. Right. <laughs> Man. And I th- I think that they were, someone's probably said this, like they were reality TV before reality TV because we love the music, but so much of it for sure is like, oh my God, this can you imagine about- the drama? Ugh. And then like everything had settled down. You think they're finally getting along. And then Stevie starts fucking Mick. Mick, what are you doing, you crazy son of a bitch? That is that is uh, that's wild. And I was told that um, I was having this conversation, and I was told that I have to watch. Uh, there are a couple of VH1 behind the oh, music yeah. specials that I guess are great on Fleetwood Mac. I remember VH1 really like nailing the behind the music stuff. That was that's why I am the way I am. Because okay. I, I watched that. Show. I was definitely of blame. the age. Yeah, I was definitely of the age where. I would that shit came on when I would be watching TV. I've seen the behind the music on everybody, mm-hmm. and that's probably why I like, try to pull it every thread about like what's that song about and what's going on with this thing. Anything that's like any behind the scenes thing or people working in a studio, mm-hmm. I'll watch all fucking day. Videos of like Steely Dan playing isolated stuff. Or, okay, here's Michael McDonald's vocal and shit. Give me all of that. And there for sure is not enough of it about uh, Fleetwood Mac because if there was a lot of footage of them when they were making, especially those two albums, the X rated because they'd be fucking the whole time. No, there would just be coke everywhere. Yeah, they they had. I did hear that uh, bags of co- like heard, like heard, huge bags. I of heard coke. that at one point a doctor told Stevie that if she did one more line of cocaine, that her nose would just collapse. Yeah, yeah, and I mean. I don't know if this is why or if just aging or whatever. She for sure, even 97, absolutely not the same. Her like voice was completely not gone, but her range was minuscule. But that's what that's why I didn't like it when I first came out. She, I was like, these people sound like old people. Why do I? Why am I supposed to care about fucking Fleetwood Mac? It's a bunch of old people got together and made a band. <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> and then once I understood shit a little better, I was like, oh man. 
they got to back together when they were old, which they were probably like 50. Uh, they made, they, yeah. Mick looks super old. Uh, Mick looks, yeah. Like Stevie didn't look that old. Maybe like 40s. I don't know. Uh, but like, wh- why has there not been like a Fleetwood Mac movie? Oh, God. Like, if I, we're doing musical biopics, how yeah. is that not near the top of the list? I could see Stevie saying no. Stevie Stevie and and Lindsay are both very stubborn. and But I don't know. It Christine's dead, famously, mm-hmm. unfortunately. That was recent, wasn't it? Yeah. Real bummer. I do love in uh, in the video of them doing Silver Springs. Such a delicate song. And Mick is just such a bruiser <laughs> yeah. that when he's like playing the, the the drum fills, he's like hitting the toms like. And he's, he he has speaking of drugs, he looks like he is absolutely living on another planet. I love when drummers play drums like they're like saying tap. Is there him like <laughs> like tap on you? Subscribe to the Patreon. Fleetwoodmac.com slash Patreon slash brunch.